I'm glad you joined me today as we kick off this new message series entitled simply Miracles. Nothing's impossible with God. And so I'm excited about this as we focus on miracles throughout the summer of 2020. And I hope you'll look forward to the messages that will come in the future. But today we're going to focus on the beginning of this series from probably the best place we could start from the beginning. As I was praying and thinking about this series and thinking about all the miracles of Scripture and how how uh, how much I'm looking forward to sharing with you about these miracles and really just diving in and saturating our hearts and minds and meditating on uh, the fact that God is able to overcome uh, whatever challenges that His people face. And so I, I'm excited about looking at these miracles with you. And I was saying, Lord, where do you want me to start with this? There's so many miracles that we could begin with. And I, I just really felt the impression of the Lord on my heart to say, in the beginning, in the beginning. I, I know we talk about creation and the wonder and the amazement of the event of creation in Genesis chapter 1. But have we ever thought about it as a miracle? Truly, the first miracle of Scripture. In fact, it's so much a part of God's story as a miracle that every other miracle that ever is and has been experienced happens within the framework of the miracle of creation. In fact, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, it just says simply, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And that's where we will start with this series on miracles. Yes, the blind see and the dead are raised and the lame walk and the mute speak and those that are in bondage are released to freedom. Yes, those are powerful miracles. But the very first miracle that we come to in the scripture begins with a prepositional phrase. It's a unique word, in fact. It's a word, uh, better sheet or breshit. It's the prefix ba, which means into or for. And, and we look at it from the idea of in the beginning or beginning, reshit. And the word reshit is a unique word that is only used in the Hebrew scripture this one time. And it's unique because there's a, there's a link between the beginning of creation in Genesis chapter one and the end of all things. So this is amazing. Whenever we think about in the beginning, we don't think about an isolated event that God started something that he really didn't know what was going to happen later on. We understand that in the beginning is in the beginning with the end in sight. That's right. God created in the beginning with the end in sight. Now, just think about that for a moment. Think about the miracle of Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. Yes, the seven days of creation, the six days of creation and the seventh day he rested is a miracle. But then allow yourself to expand to not only Genesis chapter 1, but all the way through human history. Both ends of the spectrum of time are brought together in Genesis chapter 1, where God creates the beginning with the end in sight. What a miracle. What a miracle, and that miracle is where every other miracle occurs. And so we begin today talking, just like we did last week with Pentecost, with Genesis chapter 11 and Acts chapter 2. Today we're going to take two passages again and take a look at them. Now, normally I design or work with messages around three moves in the message that you don't necessarily need to know that, but today there's two moves. Now, I can't guarantee that that means that a third of the time of this message will be cut off, but it does mean that I want you to know that if you don't see a third move in this message, it doesn't mean that I forgot. But today we're going to talk about these two moves, and we're going to move from Genesis chapter 1 to John chapter 1. That's right. John chapter 1 in John's gospel begins with the same phrase that Genesis chapter 1 begins with, in the beginning. And so what we're going to do is focus on two primary points of interest today. We're going to talk about the word spoken 
in Genesis chapter 1, and then in John chapter 1, we're going to focus on the word given. The word spoken and the word given. Now, the word is Jesus. And Jesus doesn't have a creation day. He is the creator. He is preeminent. He has always been. There's never a time when Jesus wasn't. He is absolutely God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit in relationship, in a relationship bound together with a love and a mutual love between these three operating unique uh, functions of the Godhead in human history and in creation. So here we have in Genesis chapter 1 the word spoken. This is where we read in the scripture when it says in verse 3, and God said, let there be light. You see, it was the spoken word that activated the creation event. God spoke, and it was. Over and over in Genesis chapter 1, God speaks, and it was, and it was good. God speaks, it was, and it was good. God speaks, it was, and it was good. There was land, there was sea, there was animals that flew, there were animals that crawled, there were water separated from the sky, and land separated from the water. And, and, then, and then the pinnacle of Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Now, the miracle of creation in Genesis chapter 1 is the highest of his creation in, in verse 27. That God create, create, create. It's the repeat of the word create that brings the fullness of the, great, the greatest creative act of God is you and I. So as we think about this today, we think about this idea of the word spoken in Genesis chapter 1. Now we think about this from this aspect of how are we going to become connected to God's plan to create and recreate new life in Christ. If all of these things that we've experienced as miracles have happened within time and space and human history between the creation in Genesis chapter 1 when God began the heavens and the earth from the end or with the end in mind, how is it that we now are going to participate and experience what God's purpose and plan is for us, His creation, within the miracle of creation from the beginning to the end? How are we going to participate that? And so many people choose to deny the existence of God. The place of God, the authority of God, the sovereignty of God is ignored by His very creation. In fact, whenever we look at this and this idea of beginning from the end, it's a beautiful picture. At Genesis chapter 49, verse 1, all the way to Deuteronomy chapter 31, verses 28 and 30. The end of the first book and the the end of the first book and the end of the last book of the five books of the Pentateuch. This is what it says uniquely. Come together. And let me tell you about the days to come. It even expresses in the Pentateuch that this idea of come together and let us talk about the things that are to come. That it wasn't a mistake. That God didn't just start something and then he's just let it go and we can choose what we want or we can do whatever we want with it. But God designed the beginning from the end so that we would experience the fullness of all that God has for us in relationship with him. And it's this beautiful picture of come together and let's talk about the days to come. I wonder, we spend so much time talking about things that are orientated from the left and the right. We as God's people, or as Christians, as, as followers of Christ, have been orientated in Scripture to look forwards and backwards, not left and right. Now think about this. We have been shown through creation from the beginning to the end, forwards and backwards, that God is faithful and he's trustworthy. But it's when we start looking left and right that we lose sight of what God has for us next. You know, when we think about it, that God is unchanging. There's no reason for us to veer to the left and right in relationship with him. 
All we need to do is just move forward. In fact, it's when God's people historically through the scriptures have found it difficult to press on forward. Like the spies, the 12 spies sent into the promised land to spy on the land to see what they were going to face when they moved forward coming out of Egypt and through the Red Sea. Then they come back and they say, look, we can't go forward. There's too big of obstacles. There's too many things in front of us. And so two of the spies came back and said, hey, with God's help, we'll make it through this. But the other 10 said, there's no way. There's giants in the land and they're going to eat us alive. And it's in that picture of fear and worry and doubt about our own human ability that we begin moving left and right. Listen, circling in the wilderness is an orientation of left and right focus. Moving forward into God's plan and purpose is an orientation of forward and backwards. Forward, trusting in His faithfulness, looking backwards and reminding us and telling the story of everything that God has done. Listen, creation is the miracle of God from beginning with the end in sight, showing us that He is every bit trustworthy. That he hasn't turned us loose and doesn't know what's coming next. He is trustworthy. Whenever we think about this, though, this idea of moving left and right, uh, Leonard Sweet, in his new book, Rings of Fire, says it this way. When we move left and right, sometimes it's because we're trying to get out of the way of something that is happening or, or could happen to us to preserve ourselves. And that's essentially what happened to the Israelites in the wilderness whenever they were afraid to move into the promised land. I just love that. You know, it just nothing says more about God's faithfulness than a promised land in front of us. But they begin to look left and right and realize, look at, look at us. We're not going to be able to overcome these people. And so they ran from that promised land opportunity, and they ended up circling in the wilderness for 40 years. He says it this way, we, we're like the Haitian family, so traumatized by the January 2010 earthquake that they fled to Chile, only to go through an even greater earthquake a month later. Or the Mitsubishi engineer, Yamaguchi, who fled the bombing of Hiroshima during World War II, taking refuge in Nagasaki. How terrible it is to live our lives trying to escape one peril that's in front of us and only realizing we've turned into a greater peril when we've turned either left or right away from the purpose and plan of God. I think in a lot of ways as we recognize that society around us is unraveling. There are evidences all over that there is trouble galore and we are right in the middle of an unprecedented season where we're having to second guess what we've always known or thought was true. When we look at God in creation from beginning with the end in sight, we come back to that challenge. And that miracle, will we press on forward regardless of the challenges we see ahead of us? And it's within that challenge of creation and the belief that God has set in motion what he desires that God's people come back and say, Father, you've been trustworthy in the past and you will not let us down in the future. We will move forward. Well, creation and the miracle of creation is our recalibration to understanding the faithfulness of God. If we, listen, if we can't recover the alignment of creation from the perspective of many that are moving left to right, then we will continue to lose the next generation of young people. Let me say that one more time. If we fail to be recalibrated by the creation and the picture of God's faithfulness and the outlining of the end for the beginning with the end in sight, we will fail to reach the next generation with the truth of Jesus Christ. There's a foundation called Pine Tops who issued a, uh, an opportunity 
called the Great Opportunity for the American Church of 2050. They came about with a challenge for the American Church to reverse the tide of one million youth leaving the church per year as they recognize it as the most significant domestic evangelism challenge in American history. One million youth leaving the church every year. When we think about the challenges ahead of the church, would we think about it in terms of recovering an, a, a, the miracle of creation? And that God's people would recover the desire to move forward faithfully, believing that He is leading us forward into the promised future that He has for us, and to not be persuaded to move left or right, but to keep on the path moving forward. There's a reason why wide is the gate to destruction and narrow is the gate that leads to life that Jesus talks about in the Gospels. Whenever we think about the crisis of reversing the tide of one million youth leaving the church per year, there's two illnesses that are present in the church today, and they're probably the worst illnesses that you could have at the same time. The two illnesses are simply this, a reproduction crisis, and a reproduction crisis is this, we cannot reproduce the faith in our children, our communities, our churches, and our world. The next crisis is this, anisognosia. Anisognosia is the illness that is the ignorance of illness. So we have a reproductive crisis, and we also have the illness of ignorance of the presence of Ill illness. Now, when we think about the challenges in the church today, we may not think about it from the standpoint of a reproductive issue, but that's exactly what it is. In the Great Commission, Jesus says, now go and make disciples of all nations, make followers of Christ, reproduce followers of Christ. We understand that to be making disciples. And if we are unable to reproduce disciples or followers of Christ, then we run the risk of falling into other species categories like endangered or possibly extinct. Not extinct that the church is going away, but extinct in the community and the congregations that gather in certain communities having a witness and an opportunity to be a part of God's recreative act in the world. Now, reproduction, if you look in Genesis chapter 1, is what creation was all about. Everything that God created had the ability to be fruitful and multiply. And this is what he desires for his church. And if we are going to recover or recalibrate to the miracle of creation, then we will see this as an opportunity to pray, Father, help us to once again become a reproducing body within your advancing of your kingdom. That should be on the prayer list for every church in America today. Father, help us to begin reproducing disciples. Listen, it's a challenge. Uh, there is no way to accept that information any other way. And I want to challenge us with this idea that we look at creation and everything that God did during these six days and even on the seventh day when he rested and made that day holy as a way of looking back and saying that, that there is no way that we can work seven days a week and accomplish any more than God accomplished in the six days of creation. We rest and we worship because God is creator. When we think about the miracle of creation, it's the example of God's ability to reproduce within his creation new life. And this is where we find this link between Genesis chapter 1 and now if you'll turn with me to John chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1 to John chapter 1. Look at what it says. John chapter 1 verse 1. In the beginning was the word. It was the spoken word. It was the reality of Jesus as preeminent, uncreated. 
the Word, and the Word was with God, preeminent, and the Word was God, deity, shared relationship, coexistent, co-equal. Jesus wasn't a little God. He is God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. If we think about a miracle enigma, divine enigma, or a mystery, the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, is an enigma. It's a mystery. But we understand clearly by the representation of Scripture how God has chosen in, in God the Father to act, in God the Son to sin, and in God the Spirit to dwell and abide with us until we reach Him one day as He comes for us. So we think about this and the power of creation. And we turn to Genesis or John chapter 1 and we find the creation as a recreation. Listen, whenever Genesis chapter 3 comes around and the fallenness of man occurs because of sin, giving in of temptation, taking and eating of the only tree that God said to stay away from, and when we recognize sin entered in, the creation began to have altered effects because of the presence of sin. The wages of sin is death. Death was entered into creation, and creation started to feel the effects of that broken and fractured relationship that sin brings between creation and God the Father. His purpose is broken at that point. But we see in John chapter 1 that God doesn't choose to fix creation as his focus. He chooses to repair the relationship with, his, with humans as his focal point. And this is this beautiful thing that happens in John chapter 1, where Jesus, the Word of God, brings about the ability, the Creator brings about the ability to be recreated as a miracle within the miracle of creation. God Himself enters the story, beginning with the end in sight from Genesis chapter 1, he enters his own story and he recreates the broken relationship, reconciles new beginning between people who have sinned and himself. And he dies within that span of creation as a human and he's raised victorious and glorious as first fruit from the dead. And this is the picture of the miracle of creation. The word spoken in Genesis 1 and the word given in John chapter 1. Well, here's what it says. The word is eternal. John chapter 1 verse 1, the word is God. John chapter 1 verse 3, the word is the creator. The, John chapter 1 verse 4, the word is the source of life. John chapter 1 verse 12, the word is the source of salvation. John chapter 1, verse 14, the Word became flesh, incarnate, in body. The Word in John 14, or John 1, 14, the Word is the Son of God sent or given by the Father. The Word is given. The Word spoken and now the Word given. Well, I want to conclude with this out of John chapter 14, verse 6, where Jesus says, in conversation with Timothy, or uh, not Timothy, uh, um, Thomas, excuse me, when he's talking to doubting Thomas. And he says this in John chapter 14, verse 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, think about this. God created the beginning with the end in sight as a, as a lion of his knowledge of creation from start to finish, forwards to backwards. And Jesus enters into that human history that God has created and declares, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Now, many people would look at that and say, well, that's, that's very exclusive and not very inclusive. But it's actually just the opposite. It's extremely inclusive because he makes himself available to all people. It is exclusive 
because he makes it very clear that there is one way to experience the recreation. It's exclusive through him. Now, when we think about creation, and we think about what the challenge is to understand the miracle of God's creation and then the recreation in John chapter 1, it is this, that when we look at what Jesus has said and what God has done in creation, and we start to move left or right, then we move off course from what he said as his design. And some people would say, well, there's many ways to get to God, left and right. But there's only one way through Christ. Exclusive, inclusive, but exclusive of his finished work on the cross. You see, the challenge is that we would move away again from left and right looking for the answers and instead look backward and forward at what God has done, what he is doing, and what he has planned in the future. Come. Let us take a look at what is coming in the days ahead because God is already there. What a miracle. What an absolute miracle. As we think about Jesus being the way, exclusive, not by works, not by going right or left or trying to figure out some way, but by just trusting, look what you've done, Christ, I will go in this way and follow you, Jesus. Well, he's also the truth. And so many people go to the left and right looking for meaning, trying to figure out who am I? What is the purpose of my life? Who am I supposed, you know, what am I supposed to do? How am I supposed to function? How am I going to get around these obstacles in front of me? And the whole point is that Jesus is the truth. It's not something to find. It's someone to call upon. He is the truth. In fact, in John 18, 37 through 38, whenever Pilate was interviewing Jesus after his arrest, it says, Jesus told him, everyone that belongs to the truth hears my voice. And Pilate wondered aloud, what is truth? And what is truth is probably one of the most terrible questions we could ask because that leads us on so many different journeys away from God But rather, instead of what is truth, we would ask who is truth. And Christ Jesus, our Lord, is truth. He even said in John's gospel, you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. You know, what a challenge that we as the American church between now and the next 30 years, 2050, would be faced with the losing of one million youth from the American church over the next 30 years. One million a year, 30 million youth. What would we do in that moment if we had the ability to say, Father, by the miracle of creation, would you call us back to a forward backwards relationship with you where we look back at what you've done and how faithful you've been and look forward Believing that nothing in front of us will keep us from going forward as you lead us. I'm burdened by that. I'm burdened by that whole idea of losing that many young people in this country that miss out on our relationship with Christ. The last one is this, not only the way and the truth, but also Jesus is our life. We find endurance through him. Verses 3 through 5 say this in John chapter 1. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Listen, Jesus is our life, but he's our light. He's lighting the way. He's showing us the direction we should go. When you look at Genesis chapter 1, the first thing that God did when he spoke his word in creation was light. And that light dispelled the darkness. And the first thing we see happen in John chapter 1 is that Jesus is the light and the darkness has not overcome it. Oh, people of God, would you receive this and receive the challenge of living in the miracle 
of God's creation and in what he wants to do to recreate life. The, the, the dispelling of darkness and the bringing of light into every life that has searched left to right looking for the answers, that they would find the answer in Jesus alone. I just wonder, what have we done to reproduce lately? What have we done to not be consumed by things that are right to left and instead be concerned and consumed with things that are right in front of us? Challenges that we face that we in our own strength don't have the ability to affect, but God does. And if we'd be willing to run straight into it, no matter what it takes, I know God can and will activate his church to reproduce disciples as we pray with broken hearts that he would lead us. I know that it's a difficult message to hear, but we're talking about this in the context of miracles. And there's nothing that gets us more hope-filled and inspired by God than a miracle. And that's exactly what creation is and it's exactly what recreation is in Genesis 1 and John 1. Would we accept the inspiration of the Spirit and the power of this reminder to be recalibrated to God creating the beginning with the end in sight? He's not through with his church. He's not through with his people. And he's not through reaching the next generation. And for you and I to step up and say, God, we want to move forward and allow you to lead us so that we might reproduce disciples in the future. Today and always, our prayer, Father, here we are, send us. Bless my prayer, and that's this message today, the first of our miracle series, creation and recreation within the beginning and end that God has created. May you be blessed. May God reach into your experience and I want to take just a moment. I want to make this personal. But I want to say this to everyone that's listening. That you would know that within God's creation, that there is no one outside of the inclusive power of God's love for every person that he has created. There is no color there is no language. There is no economic status. There is no privilege that would ever give someone advantage or disadvantage to accepting and receiving the already love of God that has been poured on them as he has made them. Isn't it amazing that we live in a world that is still trying to figure out who's worth more? Well, it's a miracle. It's a miracle that in God's plan and in God's design, that every person that he has made has unbelievable worth in his eyes. That we love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And may we love our neighbors as ourselves. Father, would you be with us? Would you help us as we accept the miracle of creation as an opportunity to recalibrate on what it means to love this world and be a part of making disciples? Father, thank you for your blessings. Thank you for reaching us with the truth. Now, would you help us to love others and share the gospel? As we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, God bless you. Wonderful to kick off this new series with you. Hope you'll check out other videos on our website at fbcbwd.com. And I'll look forward to being with you next time. God bless you.